we're fortunate to have several major collections of archives that relate to the Irish Revolution. And the key collections concerning individual participants and the activities that took place in localities all over the country are in the military archives in Cahan Brewer Barracks in Dublin. Now, one of those collections is one that will be familiar to many of you, and it's the Bureau of Military History Collection, and that's the one that we're here to learn more about this evening. It is freely available and has been searchable online for quite some years now, I think maybe 12 to 14 years or so. It's essential for any local studies that are done on the War of Independence and the revolutionary period in general. And that collection, along with the Military Service Pensions Collection, has encouraged a remarkable growth in the interest in the local history of the period and also the involvement of many individuals. There are many people I know who are researching the involvement of their own family members in various organizations like uh, the IRA, Common Demand, and so on. And the work of digitizing the Bureau Collection, and indeed very much more so the work of digitizing the Military Service Pensions Collection, is really a landmark and it has revolutionized our ability to research the period. Now, to talk about the Bureau and give us particularly a um, focus on the Longford material in the collection, I am delighted to introduce this evening's speaker. Dr. Reid Morrison is the Canon Murray Fellow in Irish History at St. Catherine's College in Oxford University. Eve has held that position since 2018. She is a graduate of Trinity College Dublin, and before going to Oxford, she was in the School of History in UCD, first as an Irish Research Council postdoctoral fellow, and then as an occasional lecturer. Her research interests include the social and cultural memory of the events of the Irish Revolutionary Period. And her particular interest is, on the, is in the testimonies given by those involved. Currently, she is writing a book on those personal testimonies, which of course include the Bureau material. And she has just written a book entitled Kill Michael, The Life and Afterlife of an Ambush, which was published uh, only, I think, earlier this month by Irish Academic Press. So with that now, I'll hand you over to Dr. Eve Morrison. Thank you very much. Will I just start? <laughs> yes. And okay. I'll, I'll try to share. Okay. Uh, Hello. As I was saying, thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, the Bureau of Military History uh, and I'm going to focus particularly on, on County Longford. Now I, I want to say from the outset I'm, I'm not an expert on County Longford in the, in the revolutionary period, certainly not in the same way that, that Marie Coleman would be or Sean O'Sullivan, who I think is going to be giving the next lecture in this series about the brigade. But what I do have is, is um, you know, knowledge of the Bureau itself as a project. And I know a lot about, uh, and I've kind of, I specialize in legacy interviews and personal testimonies from, from uh, veterans of, of the Irish independence struggle in this period. Um, I did my, my PhD on the Bureau and I read, I've read all 1,773 statements um, I've been and, and so I've and I've been through all the elements of the collection as well as the administrative records associated with the project. Um, I've got a slide, Martin, if that's up there that shows um, the different elements of the of the bureau. Can everyone see that? No, Martin, you need to okay. share your screen. I thought I did. I'm sorry about this. No. Though. I'm sorry yeah. about this. Um, I think Eve, you may need to unshare your screen. Oh, I think Martin's on now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I can see it. Okay. Right. Well, that's okay. So this 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 is a slightly earlier one, but it 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 will be fine. <laughs> so what I'm gonna um uh. What I'm going to I thought I would talk about tonight is is a little bit talk a little bit about the bureau in general at first um, and then look more specifically at the at the Longford um, statements. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the project's methodology and and the and this and the statements as 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 
kind of a source for people who were writing about the revolutionary period. And actually, this is in, you know, Longford uh, is particularly interesting in this regard uh, in the Bureau. So um, hopefully it won't be too boring and academic. <laughs> um, but anyway, what, what we have here, the first slide is the is an overview of the of the collection. The Bureau was an official history project that was initiated under a Fianna Fáil government um, in, in 1947. And, and its brief was to collect personal testimony from veterans of the Irish independence struggle. Um, and it was administered by the Irish Army. It was in operation from 1947 to 1957. Um, and so the, the, the aim of the project was to collect a, a body of material that historians could use to write a history of the Irish independence struggle from an Irish perspective, because it was felt that it had been misrepresented um, at the time in the British press um, and by the by the British government. Uh, so the collection, uh, as I as I think Martin said, has been, it was made available in March two thousand and three, um, and it's been freely available online since since August two thousand and ten. Um, but but from from 1957 to 2003, it was it was closed, even though everyone was given um, a copy of their own statements. Uh, and so through that, a lot of them kind of made their way into into history books um, before that. So people have had some access to them for a long time, but not the whole collection. Um, so as I said, they, they collected 1,773 statements from about um, Oh, you know, about 1,600 people. That's because some people gave more than one statement. Um, and they, as, as, and then there's 322 collections of original documents, um, and 54 of those they, they were given by people who didn't want to give a statement. They just wanted to give um, documents. There's also press cuttings, voice recordings, um, and and photographs. As well. Now, the the contemporary documents are very important part of the collection that isn't online, although they've they've uploaded the registers to them, and it's always a good idea to look through them, um, because there's some really there there's some fascinating material, um, including lots of primary source documents from the time, um, and certainly for historians, it would be very important when you're looking at at and and using state, you know statements like witness statements and, and source materials like that that were basically they were collected a long time after the events described in them uh, occurred um and so you know in those circumstances um it, you know it's important to have it you know, to be to be quite firmly rooted in in what we know from documents from the period for for all sorts of reasons we could talk about that in the in the q a if you wish um but one of the reasons why if you move to the next slide there, Sean, it's important to uh, have a look through it um, because there's actually a few, um, you know, further witness statements and 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 other testimonies in them, including one from Longford. There's there's a, a witness statement from Sean O'Sullivan, who was a former captain of um, A Company, which is the Drumlish Company of 5th Battalion in, in North Longford, as you can see there. Um, and that was and and so and there's a few there's a and this happened in a few cases i think most of the time it happened because statements were collected but they weren't actually signed off because witnesses actually had to sign off on the statements before it become it could become part of the collection um and so you know if if for whatever reason that didn't happen um sometimes they were submitted this way through cds through through other people um so you know there was there's there's still a, a lot of of misconceptions about the bureau and the project it was it was it was criticized a lot both when it was in operation and later for a number of reasons um uh but much of what's been said and a lot of the assumptions that have been made about it are, aren't really very accurate for instance it's it's often described as a free state project or a, or a pro treaty project now this this isn't the case at all it was Basically, a, a Fianna Fáil or a De Valera project. He he played a, a central role in setting it up, and he selected key members of staff. Um, and really, they they were they, they were they prioritized participation of both pro and anti treatyites They were when setting it up, they were very careful to ensure that both sides of the of the treaty split were were represented on uh, on the bureau staff at every level. Um, 
and so and it was basically promoted as a symbol of reconciliation and kind of emblematic of Ireland's political maturity that now both sides of the civil war divide could work together. Um, and so the, t the, two, the two groups who tended to be quite hostile to the Bureau at the time were the kind of hardcore on either side of the treaty split. So, you know, the, the, the calling, calling it a free state project is kind of an irredentist slur um, because it was very common for, for uh, those who remain in Sinn Féin or the IRA after the founding of Fianna Fáil in 1926 to refer to Fianna Fáil as free staters because they recognize the state. Whereas uh, conversely, de Valera's close association with the project tended to alienate some uh, pro-treatyites. Um, so basically, so, you know, from those two extreme ends, you got a lot of hostility, but the Bureau itself and the people who participated in it was basically, you know, I suppose you could call it a project of the of the middle ground, you know, pro and anti-treaty. So, you know, so that by, you know, so basically from 1938 onwards, you have this core, the majority of the, of the revolutionary generation had kind of one way or another been accommodated to the state and brought in from the cold. Um, so and and so you had so 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 that uh, certainly in terms of the the political con conception of the bureau wasn't really true. It was also criticised by members of the bureau's advisory committee of historians. This is particularly Robert Dudley Edwards and Florence O'Donoghue. They were, um, you know, it was criticised for being unprofessional and they were critical of the methodology used by the bureau. Um, but it's important to bear in mind that uh, both men had hoped to play a much more prominent role in the Bureau than they were given, and they were both very uh, resentful of that. Um, Edwards, for instance, never forgave the government for not putting historians in charge, um, and he wanted he wanted the, the project to focus more on collecting documents rather than witness testimony, and he wanted, you know, history students to do the interviews. The, but the government felt that veterans would only speak honestly or even at all to other veterans, and I think they were probably right about that, although I suppose we'll never know. Or as Bureau uh, Od Florio Donoghue, on the other hand, was a was a veteran of of the Cork Cork City IRA, and he'd he'd originally been a, a bureau investigator, which is the investigators what they called the people who actually went out and did the field work and collected the statements. But he had such a fractious relationship with Michael McDumphy, who was the bureau's director that he was reassigned in May uh, 1948 to the advisory committee. And this really colored his attitude. Um, but in reality, most of the criticisms they made don't really hold up. I mean, when it w within the context of the time, the Bureau's methodology was actually very good. And in some respects, it was ahead of its time. Um, I mean, one of the most important things about it is that witnesses themselves controlled the content. They decided uh, what was included in their statements. Uh, now, the military archives redacted passages from a few of the statements before the collection was released in 2003, but there was no attempt, I could find no evidence of any attempt to censor the material by the government or the Bureau at the time. Um, and McDumphy also issued guidelines to, to investigators advising them to take down uh, accounts of the witnesses exactly as they were told to them even if what that person said totally contradicted other accounts of the same event, and even if the investigator thought what was being said wasn't correct. Um, now, these instructions from McDumphy are, are standard practice in oral history now, um, you know, because the point is, is that you record what people actually remember rather than what you want them to remember. And you just, and, it, and you really would be seen as 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 kind of corrupt practice to, to try and shape what an interviewee said. But it went completely against the grain of how narratives of the independence struggle were put together by veterans at the time. Um, because most of the time, you know, when they were pushing to this is, you know, and you have to remember in this period, they were also putting together material for military service pensions um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and putting together pamphlets and commemorative material. And most of the time, the way they did that was through kind of communal composition and review you know, so, so that so that basically groups of veterans would get together and they would look at individual testimonies and they would correct them or they would devise them collectively. And, you know, and, th and that they would remove or, or to, you know, uh, information that they that they thought was wrong. 
Um, and so, and this is actually what Flory O'Donoghue had wanted to, the Bureau to do as well, but McDonfey refused. And thank goodness he did, because the, the statements are, are a lot more interesting for that. Um, and it doesn't mean that they don't have their limitations. I think one of the most uh, important points Marie Coleman made in her book on Longford uh, in during the Irish Revolution was that Sinn Féin's efforts to establish a counter-government was just important as if not more important than the military campaign. There's almost nothing about this uh, uh, this side of of uh, the independent struggle in, in the statement. There's a few, but not that many. And it's also that like they, the only RIC men they, they interviewed uh, were those who helped the IRA. There was no families of civilians shot as spies who interviewed. There was no loyalist interviews, no unionist interviews. I mean, my point isn't to criticize the bureau because that wasn't you know that that wasn't what it was about it was about documenting the people who fought for irish independence and that's fine but it is important to acknowledge that that it it documents one side of the story you know and so and it's always important when you're you know to bear that in mind when you're using that and you're reading them um and it's also you know one of the other aspects of of of, of the bureau is that they were primarily interested in IRA officers and peop- and men who fought in the flying columns. Ra- and, and so th- this was who they focused on rather than the rank and file. Although they did, you know, interview a few ordinary members and 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 um, they interviewed about 153, I think it is, members of Cumann Amon and a few members of, of Fina Aaron and things like that. But they were they were mostly interested in in the men who did the fighting and the you know and the officers at at brigade and and battalion level, um, and so you know so the statements tend to have quite a narrow operational focus you know so there are lots of of ambushes and engagements and arms raids and assassinations and things and so in that sense it's kind of old fashioned military history now this was very common at the time, um. So, and this is, if you move on to the next slide, Martin, it should be, should, is it suggested headings for statements? Okay, it's not that one. Can you move forward? There should be, uh, no, keep going. No, keep going. There we go. Okay, so that's impossible to read. Oh, go back. One. Yeah, okay. Now, see, there was very, a few different questionnaires that were used at the time. I'm sorry, I can't maybe put that up online afterwards. People will be able to read it uh, better. But that gives you, those are suggested headings for statements. Now, you didn't have to stick to that. But that will give you an idea of the sort of questions that they that they were asking um, the witnesses. And... Uh, and so you know, and so and so, it's 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 good to have that sort of information when you're trying to assess why certain information is in there, and you know, and other other equally important information doesn't seem to be. Um, so one of the interesting other interesting things about the bureau is that officially they were only supposed to collect statements about the period from 1913 to to 1921. So so you know, the founding of the volunteers to the to the truce. Uh, and the main, and basically, so they were excluding the Civil War. Um, and the reason why they did this is because they wanted to secure the cooperation of of, of Fine Gael and and pro Tritiites, which was they, you know, because they they were some of them were very pretty hostile to um, to the project. Now, th- but the thing is, is that is that they, so that you, you had this official um, kind of restriction, but they didn't really adhere to it, uh, you know, and, and they quietly kind of dropped it in October 1951. Um, so what you have is over 40 of the Bureau's documents collections have have material about the truce in the Civil War. Um, and also about 160 statements talk about that, you know, go past the 1921 period as well, although not always in very much detail. Um, but if somebody wanted to give a statement about the Civil War, they were let. You know, this it's kind of as simple as that. Um, and so if, if you go back now, Martin, to the slide about that has the uh, back again. And back again. There we go. OK, so this is so the, so the Bureau was one of three. Martin talked a little bit about this in his introduction, but there was one of three major attempts between the, or efforts, I should say, between the 1930s and 1950s to document um, the independent struggle. And these were the Bureau, the Bureau was one, um, the other two were the military service pensions and Ernie O'Malley um, 
who was a writer and kind of famous anti-treaty veteran, um, also did a, his own his own um, interviewing project. And as you can see there, there's there's about there's 21 witness statements uh, relating to Longford. Ernie O'Malley interviewed five people who were uh, in, from the Longford IRA. I'll, I'll come back and talk about those again. And so far, I just looked it up, there's about 166 uh, military service pension claims. Individuals have claimed those have been released. Most most of the um, uh, military service pensions for Longford haven't actually been released. Um, and so, as I said, the, the, the Department of Defense or the Irish Army administered um, the Bureau, they also administered the military service pensions. And basically through administering the pensions, the Department of Defense had had basically kind of created the most significant and largest single repository of available material relating to the revolutionary period in Ireland that, that, that we have. Um, and what was really crucial about the operations of the Bureau is that it was given full access to these records to the msp records and the you know you have to remember this is you know these these were still confidential files um but what they were was it was a massive database of of ira veterans and common demand veterans and you know because if you think about it see what they did is there was an effort in the 30s to go out and say you know people set up brigade committees all over the country and they submitted lists of members and all this other material if they didn't have that the, you know if they hadn't had access to that it would have been much more difficult um for for the bureau to to basically to carry out the project on the scale that they did um and so basically the, this the 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 uh military service pensions were the most uh, important control that the bureau had um they employed two former members of the referees advisory committee um uh, to basically use the MSP that what they're releasing now, they're the nominal roles and activity files. They they use them to draw up extensive lists of officers and activities. Um, and these were the main source that they used to identify people to interview. Um, and this is, you know, and they use as the basis to, to, to uh, you know, to, to, to ask people to devise questions and questionnaires. And if you go forward, Martin, there should be, I think I have an example there of one of the the lists. If you go forward once more, there we go. Now, I don't know if you can see that very well. That's they were go back one. Yeah. Uh, now that that's called, they're they're called derivative files. These are these are bureau administrative files, and you can see there what they did. They used uh, one of the nominal roles for the MSPs to devise a list of the officers of the Longford Brigade and they listed all the company captains and all the all the all the company officers as well. And basically the bureau investigators went out with the, these are the lists they used, right? Um to, to pick their interviews. You can see that in you know in terms of Longford, um Tom Reddington was deceased. Um and actually so was Patrick Allen. So you see, you know, um and so you know some people were gone. Some, you know, they didn't, some people they actually couldn't find at all. Um, but as you can see, this is, you know, one of the interesting things you can even see from this list is a lot of the, of the brigade staff was also attached to the flying column, which actually does, you know, was, was relatively unusual at the time. Most you know, oftentimes there wasn't, you know, there, there might've been a certain amount of, of crossover between the brigade staff uh, and the flying column, but, but, but not always, but in this case there was. Um, and so, so you know, so this is so it's really, you know, you can't really understand the bureau, you know, or or how they put it together without having some sort of knowledge of of the military service pensions. And so we're very lucky that the the military service pensions are being released as well. Um, and so, as I said, if you go back one now, Martin, there should be there. We don't actually at this stage know how many. Uh, long how many msps there are for longford they have not very many have been released so you get partial information like this like this is from the sean McKeown read this out in in april 56 about the number of people resident in longford 
right, who who were who were receiving pensions under the various acts and then special allowances, which would have been like disability or families of volunteers who had died and things like that. So you can see that. But the thing is, like, there's there's um and and that you couldn't do this now, but they listed. You can get it on, on in the Oireachtas debates, but they list every single person and exactly how much they were getting. Um, and so, but but for instance, if they, you know, so but there's lots of bureau witnesses from Longford who aren't on the list because they weren't living in Longford all the time and all this. So there's all sorts of. So you have to be careful with this sort of material. But it is still interesting. Um, and so you know, and 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 so. As you can see there, there's what, so yeah, 420 people. And I suppose a quite an important context um, for the Bureau as well, particularly in relation to the military service pensions, um, was that uh, the most common reason for refusing to give a witness statement was not the Civil War, as everybody assumes or often assumes. It was rather people who were angry at the results of their uh application for a military service pension or a disability pension um and so something like a hundred thousand people applied for pensions but only about 18 percent of the claims were successful so it was a very controversial project and as you can imagine there were or process and it was a very there was lots of disillusioned veterans out there um and so it's a very significant proportion of bureau witnesses are also successful uh military service pension applicants um, so we don't know, like we like that. I don't. We'll have to see whether they're going to release the the unsuccessful ones. Um, so if you move forward there, Martin, we can do the list of the Longford statements. Uh, okay, there we go. No, I've included the Ernie O'Malley testimony, Ernie O'Malley interviews as well, just for for information. Um, now, as you can see, there they were taken from five of of Longford Brigade six battalions. Um, and there was a concentration on on the first battalion, um, which was which was considered the the most active battalion. Um, and you as and I've got the treaty stance where I've been able to 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 identify it for for most of them. If anybody sees them, any mistakes in that, that's please let me know. Um, and so you could and a lot of them. So most of them were pro treaty as you'd expect because Longford was you know supported the settlement. Sean McKeown supported the settlement. Um, uh, and and a lot of the interviewees were were former former ar army officers. Uh, I've included Bridget Lyons Thornton's as Bridget Lyons Thornton as well. I mean, she was active in lots of areas, but she grew up in Longford, so I'm counting her as a Longford witness. Um, now, in, Ernie O'Malley interviewed five uh, Longford veterans, uh, including three who, as you see, three of them gave uh, witness statements as well, and, and he transcribed some of Seamus Conboy's and, and Francis Davis's statements into his notebooks. But O'Malley was particularly interested in Sean Connolly. He, 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 he wrote a manuscript about him. And Sean Connolly was, was from Longford. He was, he, he was uh, fatally wounded at Selton Hill and Leitrim in March 1921. So as you can see there, uh, Ernie interviewed his sister. Um, so and I work with the the O'Malley notebooks a lot as well. So and 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 I'm trying to ascertain the treaty stance of all his interviewees and the bureau as well. So um, it's and I thought it was going to be a lot easier than it's turned out to be um, because and so I'm still not sure. As you could see, about two of Ernie O'Malley's interviewees who weren't interviewed by the bureau. It's it's uh, Pat McGraw and Paddy. I don't. I'm not sure how to say Mullery. Mullery, maybe, might be the name. I looked it up in the 1911 census. Mullery's, it's a, it's a Longford name. There's no Mullery's anywhere else in Ireland in 1911, at least. And and uh, Ernie misspelled it as Mulleroy. Um, and so I haven't been able to find out much about that. If anybody knows, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. I think Sean McKeown talks very brief, it makes a very brief mention of the, of the uh, Mullervy brothers in his statements. Um, now, Sean McKeown himself didn't actually get around to submitting a statement until the, the Bureau was almost finished. I think one was in 1955 and the other was in 1957. But in the end, he submitted two and they were one of which was it's, it's 200 pages. And I think there's another separate, uh, very lengthy um, set of appendixes and then a further statement about something else. I think it's about his meeting with Alfred Cope. 
Um, and but what he also he but he was very supportive of the bureau. He did help them in 1951. He wrote a, a letter of support uh, to give to investigators assigned to Longford that they would bring with them when they were approaching people to to interview. You know, and and the the bureau often did this. They often kind of enlisted the help of local officers. You know, to 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 to, to you know make. To, to, you know, to kind of ease it in, because sometimes people were very um, reluctant to speak for all, you know, for all sorts of reasons, uh, you know, or they, sometimes they were mistrustful. Um, but I want to give you now a couple of more examples of bureau material that actually isn't available online, um, because they're, you know, because they're actually very important for uh, analyzing and assessing the statements effectively. Um, now, I hope I don't know if I put these into the. Will you go through, Mark Morris? I see. I might have added these in in a later one. Will you go? No, go back. Go for. Go for. Yeah, I don't think I put them in. Um, sadly. Okay. Um. But uh, but originally, when the statements were put together, the at the front of every statement uh, were, were comments from the investigating officer. Uh, they were called the investigator's notes. Um, but they uh, sadly they were removed by the military archives before the release of the statements in 2003. Um, and I, you know, I, I suppose the reasoning behind it was was because occasionally, not very, you know, the the, the statements were quite negative, um, and the the head archivist uh, at the time was very worried about this. I don't really understand why they couldn't have just redacted this, the negative statements and and notes and re released the rest of them, but they didn't. Um, but I eventually, um, you know, persisted and asked and asked and asked and finally got access to them for the, in the final months of my PhD. Um, and since then, I think people, researchers have been able to consult them in the military archives. Um, and they eventually now plan to put them up online, but they haven't done it yet. Um, and so uh, I just, I had a couple of, I, uh, I guess I don't have images of them. Um, but I, you know, I, I had a couple of examples of of the uh, investigators notes for for the statements of Bernard Garahan and and Seamus Conway, who were two uh, quite prominent um, Longford IRA uh, veterans. Um, but I think I've written down some of what they say, so it should be OK. Um, now, the, the you know, the reason why the investigators notes are important is because they contain a lot of information about how the statement was compiled whether it was compiled from interview notes taken by the investigator, whether it was a manuscript written by the witness, um, how many how many drafts there were, how it was changed. They also comment on the witness's memory, their willingness to discuss events, some things like that. You know, and sometimes the comments are are quite funny. I don't know, uh, you know, for instance, in Seamus Conway's um, in, in the notes for his statements, he's described as being quite normal in every way. Um, and he, you know, but he also says that James Conway had a good memory, and he also said that he was not given to boasting or trying to enhance his own importance. Uh, whereas Bernard uh, Garahan, who who when by the time he gave his statement was was in very bad health, um, his memory was much less robust, and so they say this in the statement. But they also said that he was a modest man as well and not inclined to exaggerate or mislead. Um, and the thing is, and it's, I mean, one of the interesting things you notice about the investigators notes is that the Bureau was obsessed with this idea of interviewees exaggerating their own importance. Um, and so, you, you know, and, and, the, the, and as I've said before, the, the statements can, you know, contain the information that the witnesses wanted to be, you know, wanted to be there. They couldn't not take the information if they wanted it, but investigators kind of got their revenge sometimes by commenting on how reliable they thought the witness was in their notes. Now, you don't actually, you know, you don't necessarily mean the investigator was correct, um, but it does give you some information about the rapport between the investigator and the in interviewees. And, it's, and this is important because when you're looking at, you know, uh, Ernie O'Malley interviews or bureau statements, you know, it's, a, it's this is this is an exchange, you know, the information that you're getting 
is the product of a relationship between the interviewer and the interviewee. And, you know, and that relationship impacts on the final results, you know, because and, and it's, it's particularly say, for instance, if you compare the Ernie O'Malley notebooks with some of the bureau statements, um, uh, you know, people will say remarkably different things to one person than the other. You know, and it's it's very striking in some of the, particularly when the same people are interviewed by Ernie O'Malley and the Bureau. It doesn't always happen, but it happens a lot. Um, now, you know, and the MSPs and a lot of the a lot of the controversies around the MSPs were, you know, um, were kind were a live issue, and also it was something that the Bureau uh, took into account, and that's, that's particularly relevant in terms of the of the Longford statements. For um, now, if you Go forward to slide nine there, Morris. There we go. Okay, so in the best way, so so this is this is I'm showing you the um cover of the military service pensions guide to the brigade activity reports, and there's a the, and uh, Marie Coleman has a brilliant chapter in it about the the Longford Brigade's activity reports. Um, and it's an important kind of introduction because it was it was felt by the MSPs at the time that the local Longford Brigade Committee um, had basically sent in a report that was the activity report was very inaccurate uh, and they just don't, don't seem to have been very careful when they were putting it together um, that, you know, they the number of Crown Forces fatalities is overstated by at least 27 there's ambushes listed for which there's no evidence that they occurred. And basically the, the pension board felt that Sean McKeown had been too permissive and allowed some very inaccurate uh, claims to be made by some Longford veterans. And this is all, this is what Marie talks about uh, in, in this chapter. Um, but because the Bureau was given access to the MSPs, they were aware of, of these controversies. Um, and so they were extra careful when they were uh, collecting witness statements and 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 McDumphy actually uh, asked a member of the bureau staff, uh, J.M. McCarthy, to draft a special analysis of the Longford statements in 1952. Now, if you move on, to, uh, Martin, to the to the next slide, I think there's it, there should be one more slide. Yeah, that if you go, can you, yeah. And there's a page from this. You can get the, if you go into the into the uh, into the military archives. You can have a look at this at this report. It's in the they're called the S files. Like there's a whole set of administrative files to do with the bureau um, that ba that aren't available online. There you know there's a there's basically a correspondence file for every witness. There's the investigators' notes, and then there's all sorts of other administrative files. And one of them contains this analysis of the of the Longford witness statements. Um, and what McCarthy did was check the statements against uh, the brigade activity file. And he, McCarthy describes the, the brigade activity file as very exaggerated and inaccurate. But luckily for us, he said that the witness statements were fine, generally, you know, that there um, and uh, that he. Uh, you know that basically there, you know, there was there was some difference. They weren't all of the same quality, but this was generally just because of people's memories, and and that basically the the actual statements and the information was was fine. Although he did know some that there were several incidents that hadn't yet been covered, um, but that was because the 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 witnesses who they interviewed hadn't actually been involved in them, um, and so they decided that you know that they would continue to press John McKeown to give a statement as a means of to, to 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 tie all this together so you know so and so in, in that sense i mean if, if you're going to look at the long for state statements it'd be you know it's 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 good to have a look at that report and to get a sense of of the attitude i mean this you know once once all the 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 military service pension material are out we'll get a better idea of you know what was going on but what what it what it, it certainly means is that is that mo you know the the um Long for veterans that they talked to by the Bureau of the Bureau of Military History weren't, you know, what they were saying was fine. It seems to be that whoever it was who 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 drafted the the brigade activities uh, reports just didn't like they should have just checked newspapers and things, and they don't seem to have. Um, so that's really uh, all I have to say. But I just 
I'll end by um, basically just encouraging anybody who's who's looking at and consulting witness statements when this pandemic is over and the archives open um, uh, to, to go into the military archives and take a look at the Bureau's mil administrative and other supporting material because it really does add to your knowledge. Um, and also to look at primary source material as well, like in the Mulcahy papers and Sean McKeown has a, there's a vast collection of his personal papers in, in UCD archives, which are well worth a look. Um, and, you know, because I and, and just to, finish, to say how lucky we are really to have this material, I, I don't think there's very few of any insurgencies that are as well documented as as the Irish Revolution. Um, and and the fact that it that it's freely available online or so much of it is freely available online is even more of a bonus. And so for that reason, I think the onus is on us all to do it justice by by using it carefully and well. Sinead.